me just take a moment to pause and to commit our time to the Lord myself in prayer. Let's just pray together. Almighty God and dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for the pleasure and privilege of coming before the open pages of your word. And as we do so, Father, we're very conscious that there are believers all over the world tonight who perhaps don't even have their own copy of your word in their own language, who maybe don't know any other believers and are in hiding tonight. And Lord, we just pray for them. Uh, we pray, Father, for the nation of Israel tonight and for all that it's passing through. And Lord, we thank you for your love for them. And we do just pray for that whole situation. Uh, Lord, we know uh, how peace will be eventually brought about there, uh, Lord, but uh, our hearts do break for the tragedy. And so, Father, we uh, commit that nation into your loving hands. And so, Father, we ask for your time, uh, for this time now that you would speak by your Holy Spirit, that we, Lord, might be diligent students of your word tonight. Give us open ears and open eyes to perceive the truth of your word and to put it into practice. Give us ready hands and feet to obey your word this evening, Father. And so, Lord, may the Lord Jesus Christ be the preoccupation of our hearts and minds tonight, and may we grow in our love for him. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Well, as I say, it really is a pleasure to be with you tonight, and I just want to uh, pass on uh, greetings from my wife Rebecca and myself, and also from all the Lord's people at Albert Hall in Renfrew, uh, where Rebecca and I are in fellowship. We want to bring our uh, greetings in the Lord's name to you this evening. And I want to ask you to turn your Bibles, please, tonight to the book of Revelation and to chapter 14, the book of the Revelation and chapter 14. And it's a, a pleasure to have the opportunity to spend time in this wonderful chapter tonight, Revelation chapter 14. And we're going to look at it under a number of different headings tonight. But just to put it in context a little bit, I know that I'll be speaking to many who are very familiar uh, perhaps much more familiar than I am with the contents of the book of Revelation. But by this point, the seven seal judgments and the seven trumpet judgments have passed. So we are past those two sections of the judgment of God falling upon a Christ-rejecting world. And in chapter 15, the next section of seven judgments will fall. The seven bowl judgments will fall, beginning in chapter 15. But in the intervening chapters, there is a, a hiatus, if you like, uh, from the purely chronological uh, sections of the book of, of Revelation. And um, we've been introduced to characters like the woman and the dragon, the first beast, the second beast, etc. And here in chapter 14, we have a unique chapter in my judgment. We have a unique chapter, a chapter which takes us forward in time, a chapter which gives us a preview of final victory, a preview of final victory. And as we look around us in the world today and we see all of the tumult and all of the chaos and of course, everything that's unfolding in the Middle East, it's wonderful, brothers and sisters, to know that we have a God who has final victory assured, that he is on the throne even now. He is, uh, of course, sovereign and in control even now, uh, moment by moment. But that final victory has been secured. And how has it been secured? Through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That all victory we look forward to is secured, purchased on the basis of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. So Christ is the focus. And before we turn to Revelation chapter 14, let me just turn us to Revelation chapter 1, just for one moment, please, to Revelation chapter 1. And I just want to note together how this book begins, just to set our thoughts. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So we notice this, first of all, that the book of Revelation is, first and foremost, a revelation of a person. The revelation of a person. Now, I'm, I'm going to be speaking this evening to a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ who love Bible prophecy. And that's wonderful. That's a privilege. You don't often get the chance to do that. So that's something I really value. But of course, something there's a danger, of course, in, in the study of Bible prophecy that sometimes we can get fixated on the details and details are important and valuable and we can lose sight of the one who is the absolute center of it all. And that's the person of the Lord Jesus. So as we study the book of Revelation, I just want us to have that note at the very beginning that this is all about him, all about our wonderful savior and that the study of the book of Revelation, the point of it is not, of course, an accumulation of facts or knowledge but a growing love for the Lord Jesus Christ and a growing likeness to him. 
So with all that in mind, then let's turn to Revelation 14. Revelation 14. So Revelation, of course, is a book of drama and a book of detail. And in Revelation 14, we have both. I want to speak about it under three headings tonight, three simple headings. And then I want to give each of those three sections one thrust of practical application, one thrust of practical application. So as we come to the conclusion then, at the end, I want us to bring those back to our minds and hear these three calls that I want to highlight. So first of all, we're going to see in verses one to five, the song that John hears, the song that John hears. Secondly, verses six to 13, I want us to see the messengers from heaven, the messengers from heaven. And then thirdly, verses 14 to verse 20, the time for harvest, the time for harvest. So the song that John hears, the messengers, the messenger, the messengers from heaven and the time for harvest. But as we think about those three sections, I want us to hear three calls. First of all, a call to purity, a call to purity. Secondly, a call to perseverance, a call to perseverance. And thirdly, a call to praise, a call to praise. So those are the thrusts of practical application that I believe Revelation chapter 14 makes on our lives. It's a call to purity, to perseverance and to praise. And we'll come back to that. So let's read the first five verses of Revelation 14, thinking about this song that John hears. Each section of, um, of this part of God's word begins with John seeing something new, beholding something that's being revealed to him. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Amen. And God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. So as we say, each section begins with John seeing something new. And I want to think about these few verses again under three very simple headings. First of all, the vision. Secondly, the voice. And thirdly, the virgins. The vision, the voice and the virgins. So first of all, the vision in verse one, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. What do we see here, brothers and sisters? What's being revealed to us here? Well, very simply this, things are being put right. Things are being put right. What do I mean by that? Well, what we have in, our, in, uh, in front of us here is Mount Zion. And uh, Mount Zion, of course, not, spiritually not metaphorically but the real physical literal mount zion that you could go and visit today uh, that people will be seeing on the news uh, at the moment with what's going on in israel the real mount zion i had the opportunity to spend time in israel maybe about 10 years ago now um and when i was a student at st andrews university i went out to israel for about six to eight weeks um and i worked at the garden tomb and i had a wonderful time there uh, volunteering and and uh, I did a short course in New Testament geography and things like that. And when I was there um, at this place for teaching New Testament geography, it's the old Bishop Gobat School, which is the old Protestant school, the first Protestant school established in Israel. And um, it was fascinating because it was on Mount Zion. It's built there on the slopes of Mount Zion. Uh, it's riddled with bullet holes from the various different conflicts that there have been over the centuries. And in fact, my dormitory, when I came out of the door, um, if you made your way along to the gents' toilets, the wall on the left-hand side of the corridor was the bare rock of Mount Zion. So at night when I was nipping out down the corridor, I used to run my hand along the left-hand side of the corridor and there was the bare rock of Mount Zion. Quite an amazing place to be. But that's what's, of course, in our vision here. Now, let me take you back to Matthew chapter 24, to Matthew chapter 24. Of course, a familiar chapter to students of Bible prophecy, Matthew 24, and we'll just read one of the um, the starting pistols, if you like, the starting pistols of the tribulation period, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. 
And the Lord says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, and then this aside, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now, I can't get caught up in this um, because we need to make progress. But there are those, of course, who see the rapture and see the church in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, it would be my conviction that neither of these are found in this chapter, uh, that this chapter is a chapter concerned with prophecy for the Jews, a uh, prophecy that relates to God's purposes with the nation of Israel. And you can see that in the warnings that are given in this chapter. You look at verse 16 that we've just read, then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Well, that's a warning that you and I can't put into practical practice. We can't obey that warning uh, because we don't live in Judea and we can't flee to the mountains. I don't know if you live near mountains. I do uh, because I live in Scotland. So you're never far away from mountains. But um, but certainly these are warnings for Jews because these are things which will occur to the nation of Israel. But now, but now as we turn to Revelation chapter 14, we have a very different state of affairs. Because rather than the abomination of desolation, rather than this blasphemous image being in Revelation uh, in the in the place where only God ought to be worshipped, we have the one who ought to be there standing there. We have the lamb, the lamb who was slain, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, the perfect spotless lamb of God standing where he ought to be. So Revelation 14 takes us forward. It takes us forward in time to when things are being put right. And don't we long for that, friends? Don't we long for things to be put right? And there's only one that can do it. People are discussing today, aren't they, how we can put an end to conflict, how the Middle East peace process can be uh, thought through and how it can be brought about. And, and not just that, but all the other problems of this world. And we as Bible students know there is only one solution. There is only one final ultimate solution to all these problems, and that is the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ the reign of the Lord Jesus, and uh, we look forward to that with absolute certainty. So here we're looking beyond the tribulation period, and we're looking forward to the establishment of the messianic kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, that kingdom which will, of course, be a thousand years in duration. Let's just have a think for a moment about the time in which we live, the time in which we live. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2, please. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9. And we read this in Hebrews chapter 2. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. I'll stop for a moment there. Now, we learn this truth, that all things have been put under Christ. That Christ is in the place of authority. He's at the Father's right hand. And we rejoice in that. We have a risen and a glorified Savior today. And we don't worship one who... Crucify, who was crucified and died only, but one who rose from the dead and ascended to his father's right hand has been given that name which is above every name. And we're so grateful for that, so thankful for that. But we live in a Christ-rejecting world. That wonderful hymn, The Crowning Day is Coming, begins, Our Lord is now rejected, and by the world disowned, by the many still neglected, and by the few enthroned. What a privilege it is, by divine grace, that you and I have been brought to be amongst those who do enthrone him and have enthroned him. And yet, and yet we live in a world still subject to absolute chaos and the rulership of Satan in a temporal sense. So how can we understand this? And Hebrews 2 answers it for us. It recognises this tension at the end of verse 8. But now we see not yet all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. And so you and I as believers in the Lord Jesus, we know who the real king is. We know who the true king is. And we're simply awaiting his return. And of course, when he returns to establish his millennial kingdom, he will return with us, with us. Now, the rapture is our hope. It's our blessed hope. And it's the next event on God's prophetic program. Uh, and it's what we as God's people are waiting for. We're not waiting for the Antichrist. We're not waiting for the events of uh, these judgments that we've been referring to in Revelation. We're waiting for a person, the glorious person of the Lord Jesus. That's who we're waiting for. Uh, but we know that the rapture isn't the end of the story. It features very highly in our minds, and so it should. But it's not the end of the story, because then we will return with him to establish his glorious kingdom. Now, friends, isn't that incredible? It's absolutely incredible. If you were to ask me, Ian, how will we reign with Christ in the millennium? Exactly how will that 
operate? Exactly what will that look like for us to reign with Christ in the millennium? I would have to say, I have to confess, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because there's a limited amount of information in the scriptures about how exactly we will reign with Christ in the millennium. But certainly we will. Certainly we will. And that is wonderful. I think it's always best when it comes to prophecy. If you're not sure and the Bible doesn't say exactly, then best not to speculate. And so the Bible uh, gives us limited information about that. In Psalms 2, in Psalms 2, we read this. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And then we see the response of the Lord. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then he shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. Yet have I set my king upon the holy hill of Zion. And this is a prophetic psalm, of course, as so many of them are, points us forward to the establishment of this kingdom. But isn't it interesting that in the eyes and heart of God, he is able to say through the psalmist, yet I have set, yet have I set my king. It's certain. It's absolutely certain. As far as God is concerned, it's as good as done. It's as good as done. Well, let's move on then. That's the vision. That's the vision. He sees the lamb standing where he ought to be. But then he hears, secondly, a voice, a voice. Verse two, verse two of Revelation 14. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Well, we've heard this sort of thing before, haven't we? In Revelation chapter one. Um, we won't take the time to go back there just now. But there is a total identification. There is a total identification between these 144,000 and their Lord. There's a complete identification between this choir that he's hearing and their Lord. And so their voice echoes his voice. And that's absolutely certain uh, by the way that he's led by the Spirit to write this. This choir is characterised by two things, by volume and by beauty. Now, we've all been in meetings where it's characterised by volume but not beauty. Or maybe we've been in meetings where the singing's beautiful but there's no volume. It's always best when these things come together, isn't it? When there's beauty and volume uh, together when we're singing. It's always good when they're fine together. And they're singing a new song. They're singing a new song. I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters. And verse 3 says, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne. This language comes up time and time again in the scriptures. And if I could just take you to Revelation and chapter 2, Revelation and chapter 2, Revelation 2 and verse 17. You read this, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. So there's a new name. A new name. And again, it's a mystery. There's an element of mystery to it. We remember Deuteronomy 29, 29, that the secret things belong to the Lord our God. You see, there's two things we sometimes have to hold in tension when we study Bible prophecy. And that is the perspicuity of the scriptures and the mystery. The perspicuity, which means comes from the same word as perspex, and we can see right through perspex. That's why it's called that. Um, and it's the same root as the word perspective, of course. And we believe in the perspicuity of scripture, which means that we believe that the Bible is essentially understandable. And I think that uh, the study of Bible prophecy is a great key to this, because there are many believers around us, aren't there, friends, who find the study of the, the Bible and the prophetic scriptures totally mystifying, a totally mystifying experience, completely bamboozling, because, for instance, they have the church and Israel mixed up, or they have God's purposes for um, the Jews mixed up with God's purposes for us, etc., etc., and so there is a lack of clarity, a total lack of clarity. Whereas these wonderful truths give us a key to understanding that the Bible isn't given to us to to confuse us, but rather to bring bring clarity. But then, on the other hand, there is a degree of wonder, a degree of mystery as we consider these things. And then, let me turn you to uh, Revelation chapter nineteen. Revelation chapter nineteen. And you'll see here another element of this, Revelation 19. 
And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. But he himself. So there again we have another name, another name uh, that is secret, that is withheld. But we think about this choir, we think about this choir that John is hearing, and we notice that they have a voice. They have a voice, but not voices, but not voices. This choir sings with one voice. My wife, Rebecca, and I are part of a choir up here in Glasgow uh, called the Praise Gathering Choir. It's a Scottish choir um, that's not just Glasgow, but made up of people from Glasgow, Edinburgh and Dundee and uh, all over the country, really. And it's a wonderful experience to meet together, to rehearse. And then we have a big concert, usually in the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall, although this, this year it was in the Usher Hall in Edinburgh. And uh, we sing with our individual voices. Of course we do. But we're there to praise the Lord with one voice, with one voice. There's hundreds of people in this choir, um, over 300 people in the choir. But we sing with one voice. And we notice that they sing a new song. And if I could take you to Revelation 4, Revelation 4. We'll read in Revelation 4 and 5 about two songs, two songs. Revelation 4 and verse 11. Well, we'll read from verse 10 just for the sake of context. And John writes, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, and then here we have a song, and I would call it the ancient song, the ancient song. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. My friends, that's a song that, that Adam could have sung before the fall. That's a song that Job could have sung. That's a song that Abraham could have sung. You're worthy, O Lord, because you have created all things. That's Romans 1, isn't it? That man should know, ought to know the eternal attributes of God. And these are extolled in this ancient song. But then when we turn over to Revelation 5, we read about a new song. Verse 9, and they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy. So it begins the same way, thou art worthy. But what is the focus of this song? It's different. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why? Why is he worthy? For thou wast slain. And has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests. And we shall reign on the earth. We shall reign on the earth. So there again, we have that statement of the truth that we will reign with Christ, even though the mechanics of it aren't revealed in the scriptures to us. So we have this united voice singing a new song. There are various elements to this new song that we could speak about, but... God is going to do something new. God is going to do something new. And this really is a dispensational turning point. But let's move on now to the virgins, the virgins. And we'll read from verse four. These are they. So who makes up this choir? These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. We first meet these individuals, brothers and sisters, in Revelation 7, and they are sealed servants of God, sealed servants of God. Who are they? Who are they? Well, it appears from the flow of the book of Revelation that they are Jewish evangelists, evangelists drawn from the 12 tribes of Israel uh, uh, that will be active preaching the gospel of the kingdom during the tribulation period. Now, somebody could say, uh, and rightly so, they could say, there isn't a verse. There isn't a verse that tells you uh, these individuals are Jewish evangelists. And that's absolutely right. There isn't a verse that tells you these individuals are Jewish evangelists. But the flow of the book of Revelation, the order of the chapters, the flow of the book of, Re of Revelation seems to indicate very strongly that that's exactly who these individuals are. They're Jewish evangelists. They have the name of God on their foreheads. Now, let me, you don't need to turn there necessarily for the sake of time. But I want to read you a verse or two from Ezekiel chapter 9. As we think about the name of God being on their foreheads, we learn a lesson from Ezekiel 9 about a similar thing that happened uh, in his day. Let me read to you from verse 3. 
And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. There was great abomination, great wickedness in the temple in the time of Ezekiel. And I can't go into, I'm not doing a study on Ezekiel tonight as much as I'd like to. But he is absolutely heartbroken, heartbroken at the spiritual state of his nation. And there are others that are in that same position. They are absolutely heartbroken by the state of their nation. Friends, I'm sure that that's the case for all of us on the call tonight, that we are heartbroken by the spiritual state of the nations in which we live. Now, um, I'm up in Scotland. Many of you will be down in England, maybe not all of you. Uh, but we live, thankfully, in the same country for now, and long may that continue. But we live in the same country, and uh, our country is headed uh, just for dreadful moral disaster, and uh, we are accelerating away from God at a rate of knots, aren't we? And so our hearts break. So we know what it is for our hearts to break for the spiritual state of the nation. But these men who had that perspective were marked out. They were marked out. They were marked out, and they were exempt from judgment. They were marked out by God and they were exempt from judgment. Now, that's a pattern that we see throughout the scriptures, whether it's the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorposts and lintels of the houses of Goshen, whether it's the red cord hanging from the window of Rahab, or whether it's our own redemption being marked out by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. There is this pattern in the scriptures of being marked out for exemption from judgment. This again is important when we consider the truth of the rapture. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that means that I am saved on the basis of grace, through faith, on the basis of the cross of the Lord Jesus. I am saved and I'm saved on the basis of free grace, no merit of my own. And therefore I will never have to pay the consequences for my own sin. I'll never have to pay the eternal consequences for my own sin. But neither... Will I be subject to the period of time characterized by the wrath of God? And that entire seven year period of the tribulation is characterized, both, se both sections of three and a half years, totally characterized by the wrath of God. So if the saved person is exempt from the wrath of God personally, then we will also be exempt from that period of time characterized by the wrath of God. As we look at this choir, there's a few different features that we notice. We notice their purity. We notice their obedience and we notice their honesty. We notice their honesty. By the Spirit, the, they are able to maintain purity in a dark day. They're able to maintain purity in a dark day. And this is including but not limited to sexual purity. We realise uh, from the text that they're virginal men. These are men who have not um, had relationships with women in a physical way. So they have managed to maintain purity during a dark day. That's such a call to us, such a call to us, brothers and sisters, that we live in a world absolutely saturated by sin. We are surrounded by it. We are bombarded with it on every hand and at every turn. Is it possible? Can I ask you, is it possible? And I ask this to myself first and foremost. Is it really possible for a person, for a young man, for a young woman, for older people to maintain a pure life in the midst of a world like ours? Is it really possible? It sounds and seems like an impossible ask, like an impossible ask. And now don't don't hear what I'm not saying. I don't believe in perfectionism and I uh, believe we will struggle in battle with sin. And the Christian life is a life of repentance until we see his face. But but is it possible to live a pure life following the Lord Jesus? I believe it is. I believe he's asked us to live a life of purity and he, by the Spirit, helps us to do that. And we fail and let him down all the time, don't we? And yet the Christian life is a life of constantly coming back and saying, Father, I'm sorry. And uh, a fresh start every time. Wonderful grace that gives what I don't deserve, pays me what Christ has earned, and lets me go free. So we see their purity, but we also see their obedience. They go whithersoever the Lamb goest. Absolutely unquestioning obedience. Whatever the marching orders are, I will accept them. That's their attitude. Whatever the marching orders are, I will accept them. 
And again, that's a challenge to my heart that I gently pass on to you tonight. Am I willing, when I come to God in prayer and ask for his will and ask for direction and leadership from him, am I willing that whatever he communicates to me from his word, I will do? Am I willing for that? Am I willing to lay everything on the altar for the Lord Jesus and to follow him no matter what the marching orders are? What a challenge that is. And then lastly, honesty. They are unscrupulously honest. What a testimony that is. What a testimony in a world of lies. You know, brothers and sisters, when we think about the Middle East conflict that's going on at the moment, we know um, that the unsaved men and women around us, our neighbours, our colleagues at work, our, maybe our family members, they are being fed so much disinformation, so much disinformation from this media outlet, that media outlet, but very, very difficult to discern the truth. Very difficult to discern the truth. If you're not a student of the word of God, if you don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit, how on earth are you supposed to understand what the truth is in a world of lies, a world saturated with what people call fake news nowadays? Well, only the word of God enables us to understand the truth of these things. And thank goodness, thank the Lord for the lamp and the light of the word of God, because without it, we'd all be lost. We'd all be equally as confused and uh, we wouldn't see a, a glimmer of hope or truth. So purity, obedience and honesty. Is it possible to live a life of radical godliness in 2023? Well, let's hear now the message from heaven, the message from heaven. And here's a call to persevere. So let's read from verse six of our chapter. Verse 6 of our chapter, down to verse 13. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the, the uh, everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, so here's another messenger, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they, uh, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours, and their works do follow them. Amen. And again, God will add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Now there's a lot of detail here in this part of the chapter. We won't be able to go into all of it, of course, just scratch the surface and say some basic things about it. But we want to, to hear these angels, if you like, to hear their distinct messages. And I would characterize them like this. The fear of God, verses six and seven, the fall of Babylon, verse eight, the fire of judgment, verses nine to 11, and the faith of the saints, verses 12 and 13. So let's think about these together, the fear of God, verses 6 and 7. Now, not long ago, I was um, able to do some studies in the Minor Prophets, and um, and I really enjoyed it, uh, doing studies in some of these books I hadn't ever preached from before. And the Minor Prophets are a very different one from the other. You know, if you put Joel next to Obadiah and Nahum next to Micah, you find that they're very different. They're a collection of prophecies uh, but they're a very, very different one from the other. But they have commonalities. And the commonality that I would point you to is this. One great theme that comes back time and time again in the Minor Prophets is this. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. But mercy is available. But mercy is available. Judgment is coming. But mercy is available. Friends, in many ways, that's the gospel message that you and I have to preach today. Judgment is coming. There is coming a day when we will all have to stand before God. And yet mercy in the cross, mercy in the gospel is available. What's our great task as the church of the Lord Jesus in this dispensation of time? It is the worship of God and the preaching of the gospel. 
the preaching of the gospel to the lost. The, we are surrounded by men, women, boys and girls in our towns, villages and cities that do not know Christ. And those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus, it's our duty, it's our pleasure, it's our privilege to take the gospel to them and to commend Christ to them and to say to them, judgment is coming. You must be ready. And the only way to be ready is to take to take the mercy that is available. And the mercy that is in, available is in a person called Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you and rose again. Wonderful. What a privilege to be involved. You know, friends, I don't know if you're like me. And sometimes you read the Old Testament maybe. And you read about things that, that took place, like the, the falling of the walls of Jericho or the uh, the leading of the children of Israel through the, the dry ground, through the Red Sea, or the Shekinah glory of God coming down and dwelling in the tabernacle. And you just think, oh, I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have been there and seen it. I wish I could have been a bystander and watched that amazing event unfolding in front of my eyes. And that's absolutely right. You know, we should we should have that instinct when we read these wonderful events. But friends, if we could choose, I'm sure we would go back to the time of the Lord Jesus being here. That he was physically here upon the earth and and you could reach out and touch him. You could have a conversation with him. You could interact with him. But do you know, brothers and sisters, that there has never been a more privileged time to be one of the people of God than this very day. Than this very day. Why is that? Because we are post-Pentecost, which means that upon conversion, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit from that very day of conversion. Now, that was never true in previous dispensations. So already we've taken a step forward from Abraham, a step forward from uh, Joshua and Moses. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit, which they never had. The Holy Spirit interacted with them and empowered men in the Old Testament for limited periods of time. But we have the indwelling Spirit. We have the indwelling Christ. And today we are one day closer to the return of the Lord Jesus for us than we have ever been. And if the Lord doesn't come tonight, then tomorrow we'll be one day closer again. And so tomorrow will become the most privileged time to be a child of God that there ever has been. Now, friends, our lives are very ordinary, aren't they? We have to go to Tesco's. We have to find a car parking space. We have to, you know, make arrangements with the family. We have to do all the ordinary things of life. And so life can feel at times very humdrum, very ordinary. And yet how important as we open the word of God to lift our eyes and to remember where we are in God's great program of salvation and the enormous privilege that God, the almighty God, has entrusted you and me. He has entrusted us with living at the very end of time, with living at the very end of time. Now, of course, Christian people, Bible students have believed for generations that we are the we are probably the last generation. We'll probably, you know, the Lord will come during our lifetime. And some people who would criticize the position that PWMI take and that many of you will take, I'm sure, about the imminent return of Christ and that I certainly take. Many critics of our position would say, well, you know, my dad believed that my granddad believed that my great granddad believed that. And he's still not here. He's still not here. Well, you know, they should have believed that. They should have believed that. It is the right perspective for every generation of Christians to have that the Lord could and will and will likely come during their lifetime because we are presented in the New Testament unequivocally with an imminent return of Christ. And so every day we are to open the curtains, aren't we, saying perhaps today, perhaps today is the day when Jesus Christ will return. And that is so vital because it affects the way we witness for Christ, the way we work for him, our gospel focus as churches as well. Uh, you know, churches get distracted by all sorts of things. And if they knew that the Lord was coming at any moment, I'm sure that churches would have a, a greater focus on the urgency of the gospel message uh, because there's a, a lost and a dying world out there. You know, um, I have to travel quite a bit in the Lord's work, uh, preaching the gospel and uh, teaching the Bible in various places. And so I have to get on planes a lot um, and fly here and there. And um, I, now I'm not naturally a good timekeeper. Uh, my wife, Rebecca, is much better at that. She's a primary school teacher. She keeps me right. But um, I'm not naturally a good timekeeper. So when I get through in into the departure lounge, when I get through into the departure lounge, I need to remember that my job there in the departure lounge is to do one thing. And that is to keep my eye on the board. Keep my eye on the board for when my gate will be called and when my flight is going. But do you know, brothers and sisters, that the departure lounge, especially of larger airports, is absolutely crammed with everything possible to distract me from looking at that board, whether it's a coffee shop, whether it's somewhere selling shoes or ties or 
socks, whether it's a shop selling giant sized Toblerones or whatever it is, there's everything possible to distract me from doing my one job, which is to keep my eye on the board. And that's the world that you and I live in. We have to keep our eyes fixed on the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming and yet life and everything around us and a sinful Christ rejecting world is there to distract us away from that great truth. So we have the fear of God being preached by this angel. There is one gospel. There is one way of salvation. But there is, of course, a progressive revelation through the scriptures. Uh, the, a summary of the message would really be this fear, glory and worship. Fear, glory and worship. Now, I don't believe that um, there will ever be a time where the gospel will not contain the cross of Christ. Let me just illustrate that or explain what I mean. When the gospel was being preached, when the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God was being preached by the Lord Jesus and by his disciples in the gospels, of course, that gospel that was being preached then was a gospel of preparation, a gospel of a coming kingdom, and it could not contain the message of the cross because the cross hadn't happened yet that goes without saying but as we go out and preach the gospel we preach the gospel as has been revealed up till now which is the cross of christ repentance and faith believe in the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved but i don't believe the gospel will ever go backwards i don't believe that the gospel will ever go back to us it will perhaps build on what we have been given. And of course, we have a gospel of the kingdom here, but I'm sure it will uh, absolutely have the cross of Christ central to it. But the second message about is about the fall of Babylon, fall of Babylon. And again, we will go, can't go into this in every uh, element of detail that we would want to, but Babylon stands for, doesn't it? The entire social, economic, religious, and political system of the Antichrist. The entire social, economic, religious, and political system of the Antichrist. What do we find at the beginning of our Bibles? We find that there is a, a tower called the Tower of Babel. And at the Tower of Babel, mankind is united in godless opposition against the God of heaven to disobey his commands, to disperse and to fill the earth. And a united global way is opposing God and trying to be like God, which is exactly what Satan had done. Well, this is how human history will end as well, in united global opposition against God. Uh, in the kingdom of the Antichrist. How good to know the future. How good to know the one who holds the future. Turn forward to Revelation 16. Revelation 16 and verse 19. Revelation 16 and verse 19. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. There's a recurring picture throughout the Bible of the wrath of God depicting a cup, a cup full of, as it were, sort of poisoned wine, poisoned wine that the nations are made to drink in judgment against God. And that cup, of course, in our case, has been replaced with a cup of blessing, Repla replaced with a cup of blessing. And every Sunday, as we meet together and we take the cup and we take the bread, we are remembering that out of our hands has been taken the cup of wrath. And Christ has drained it to its very last dregs. And in its place has been given to us the cup of blessing. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? We have an incredible saviour. What a wonderful saviour we have. So when we think about the fall of Babylon, we think about the fall of this great system. And again, we can't say much about it. But it's delineated for us in Revelation 18 and verse 3 onwards. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies, and so on. We won't go into this in any detail. So we have the fall of Babylon. And then we have the fire of the judgment of God, the fire of the judgment of God from verse 9 on to verse 11. And I'll keep this simple. What do we have here? The justice and judgment of God against his opponents. The justice and the judgment of God against his opponents. Sometimes when we're watching the news and we read about um, somebody who has committed dreadful crimes, somebody who has committed really heinous crimes, maybe against children or um, things that just make your stomach turn. Sometimes if they die, if that individual concerned dies before um, they are able to go through the courts, one of the newsreaders will say something like this. Well, they are beyond justice now. They are beyond justice now. And we as Bible-believing Christians say, absolutely not, never. It cannot be everybody. Everybody will face the justice and the judgment of God. 
But it's incredible to think tonight, isn't it, friends, that if you and I were to face the justice and judgment of God according to our sin, according to our transgressions, we would be as guilty as these individuals, as guilty, as condemned as these individuals. And yet through Christ, we've been set free and there is no condemnation. So we have the fire of the judgment of God and we have this image, this um, issue of hell, eternal hell. Sometimes we are um, tempted to speak about hell in ways that the Bible doesn't really um, identify with. I've heard people speak, and maybe I've I've said it uh, carelessly in the past, that that they will they will spend eternity if somebody rejects Christ, they will spend eternity away from God, away from God. And although we understand what we mean by that, is hell the absence of God, the absence of God? No, it is the the presence of the wrath of God. The presence of the wrath of God. In popular opinion, in, in, in popular culture, they think of, of heaven as the place where God rewards the saints and hell as the place where Satan punishes uh, the sinful or, or inflicts the sinful. Of course, this is utterly wrong, utterly wrong. Um, hell is the, the operation of the wrath of Almighty God. And then we have the faith of the saints, verses 12 and 13. And let me just remind ourselves of those verses. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labours and their works do follow them. Believers must endure. We must endure. Now, of course, I'm not saying we must endure to be saved. I believe that uh, those who genuinely are saved will ultimately endure. Uh, in their faith in the Lord Jesus and God will bring them back. We can all have periods of backsliding. That's absolutely possible, uh, sadly possible, uh, but God will help us to endure. We hear that call in many different parts of God's word. And uh, let me just read to you from Hebrews 10 and verse 25, a verse which I think is very important. And it's especially important since COVID, especially important since COVID. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you see the day approaching? Do you see the day approaching? I do. I think it's clear that it is. All we have to do is turn our news on to see that the pieces are being put into place for the final drama of God's project and plan of redemption. And do you see the day approaching? And if so, if you see the day approaching, are you committed to a local church of believers? Are you a committed part of a local church of believers? Because if not, then unfortunately, you're in contravention of this verse here in the book of Hebrews. God uh, intends for us, God demands of us, asks of us that we are committed to a local fellowship of his people. Now, I know that there are times in life when out of necessity, we might be between churches or because of geographical location, we might find it difficult to find somewhere. But, you know, uh, there can be a tendency, there can be a trend among students of Bible prophecy who develop strong convictions, and it's good to have strong convictions, to sort of withdraw from churches and to get their Bible teaching from elsewhere, maybe from the internet or from books, and to go to conferences, but not actually to be a committed part of a local church. And if that is you this evening, I would just plead with you from my heart to yours on the basis of the word of God, you must find and commit yourself to a local company of believers because you are uh, actually denying other believers the chance to be encouraged by you and by your gifts. And it's so important that for discipline, for, for assembly discipline, for all the different things that we need in Christian life, we need to be part of a local fellowship of God's people. So one day everything will be put right, and on this basis we are to persevere. Let's le read the last few verses of our chapter just as we close. Revelation chapter 14, and we'll read from verse 14 down to verse 20. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, 
and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. As we close, let me just divide these last verses into two parts. In verses 14 to 16, the world is reaped. The world is reaped. Verses 17 to 20, the winepress is trodden. The winepress is trodden. We started with a lamb. We started with the vision of a lamb on Mount Zion. We now end with the son of man. The son of man. And I could take you back, we won't for the sake of time, but I could take you back to Daniel 7 and that vision of the son of man and the kingdom and the ancient of days. There are two reapings. There are two reapings that we read about here. The first concerns the world in general, the world in general. The second reaping concerns unbelieving Israel, unbelieving Israel being reaped in judgment. And it is a vivid picture of coming judgment, brothers and sisters. But where will we be? Where will we be when this coming judgment is being poured out upon the face of the earth? Well, according to the Lord's promise in John 14, we'll be in the Father's house. We'll be in the Father's house. And there's a lovely prayer in John 17. Of course, John 17 is this wonderful high priestly prayer. And the Lord says to his father, I will that they be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, that they may behold my glory. Isn't that wonderful? So our great occupation in heaven after the rapture will be one occupation, and that is the beholding of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know that we will know that these judgments are being poured out on the earth. We will know that because of our study of the Bible. But we will hardly be aware that it's happening because we will be so enraptured with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if it wasn't for Calvary, brothers and sisters, if it wasn't for Calvary, we would be subject to all of these judgments. We'd be judged according to our sins and each one of us would fall and fail entirely. So, friends, as we conclude, we hear those calls we hear those calls that we started with, a call to purity, a call to purity. Is it possible to live like these 144,000? Is it possible to live a pure and godly life in the present age in our own strength? No, it's impossible, impossible. But with God's help, we can live a life that pleases God. And I just cry out to God for myself that he would help me to do that. It's our great desire, isn't it, every day just to please God, to please God, to bring him pleasure. And then secondly, a call to persevere. Are there people on the call tonight who are flagging, who are finding it difficult just to put one foot in front of the other on the narrow road? And maybe things are very difficult in your life just now, maybe in terms of health or family or financial trouble, whatever it might be. Is there anybody out there tonight who's struggling, who's really struggling? Well, I want you to hear a tender call from the heart of God tonight to persevere to persevere on the basis that the victory has already been won. And it doesn't depend on you. You know, the wonderful thing about the narrow road is that no matter how you are getting on on that narrow road, the end destination is guaranteed because it's been walked in perfection by the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our pioneer, our forerunner. And then lastly, a call to praise because we are exempt from judgment. There is no condemnation for us and we have a wonderful future ahead of us when the next thing in God's program is, of course, we will see his lovely face. And there are believers on the call tonight who have loved the Lord Jesus, spoken about the Lord Jesus, sung about the Lord Jesus, read about the Lord Jesus for decades. And yet there isn't a person on the call tonight who's ever seen the Lord Jesus. And yet one day we will see him. One day we will see him. And our eyes will meet his eyes for the very first time. And what a day that will be absolutely incredible so thank you for the opportunity to study together tonight revelation 14 and um i hope that it's a blessing to you and uh, trust um that you'll be blessed this evening in jesus name amen let's pray yes let's pray almighty god and dear heavenly father we thank you and praise you for the future you have ahead of us we thank you that this preview of final victory shows us in clear terms this wonderful victory that you will win and that you already have won on the basis of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Lord, we thank you for saving us. 
Lord, if there's anybody on the call tonight who hasn't yet placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for their own personal salvation, oh, Father, would you speak to them? Would you knock on the door of their hearts? Would you show them that they are sinners in need of a saviour and that you and your love have provided one saviour for all sinners for all time, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for what it means for the future. We thank you, Lord, that Babylon will fall. We thank you, Lord, that you are in ultimate control, that judgment and justice will be done. But Lord, then when we consider judgment and justice, we remember that if we were to be judged according to our sins, we would be condemned eternally. And yet, Lord, we thank you that tonight we have a living relationship with you through Christ. So we ask for a parting blessing now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.